Howdy folks, Derek Wayne here. Welcome to the Harmony Ball Podcast. This A Here episode is brought to you by the fine people at Fancy Free Liquor in Burbank, California. Are you provisioning your bar in preparation for the new Roaring Twenties? Well, yeehaw, buckaroo! If you make the San Fernando Valley your home, head on down to Fancy Free Liquor at 2001 West Burbank Boulevard in Burbank, California, or visit them online at FancyFreeLiquor.com, unless you're not of age. In which case, maybe check out Living in Another Country, where people walk and take trains to socialize. I mean, who did frame Roger Rabbit? It's Chinatown, Derek. Anywho, why not saddle up the Prius and take a drive to Fancy Free? You're going to be delighted by their full offering of craft beer, wine, and spirits. Tell them you're stocking up for a barbershop afterglow that's going to go all night. Happy trails. Balance. Flavor notes. Nuance. These aspects make a fine cocktail. And they make a fine vocal arrangement. And how exactly is that? On this episode, I investigate that analogy with my friend and fellow arranger, Nick Luna. Nick is the sort of craftsperson who pays attention to the details. He lives in Los Angeles. He earns his living knowing about fancy cocktails and beverages. And when he writes for a cappella ensemble, he imagines himself as a guide. I have to say, I really like that. In this interview, Nick talks about how pop music is made out of rhythm. We reminisce about the time we saw the four freshmen in concert. Yes, that four freshmen, it's still a thing. And also, Nick muses about the certain type of magic we're all chasing after. So yeah, the guy's a poet, I guess. And before we let it roll, I'll say that you can support this podcast by subscribing to the Westminster Chorus on Patreon. It's 2021, baby. Choral concerts are still on hold, and we really appreciate your support. Without further ado, Mr. Nick Luna. Hello. Hi, man. How are you? I'm doing great, man. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm thinking that I might get a glass of wine real quick. All right. I'll bear top with, off my hard cider. Bear with me for just a second. I'll be right back. Okay. So the first thing <laughs> I wanted to talk with you about is refresh my memory because it was in the before times. Sure. Did we go see the four freshmen? We did see the four freshmen with Kadar, and we ended up uh, singing some tags with their lead, actually, afterwards. Right. We sang with them afterwards at mm-hmm. Vitello's. Yeah, Vitello's in North Hollywood. Oh, man. Shout out, shout out to Tommy Boynton. That guy is really cool, and it was really great for him to take the time to sing with us nerds after his show. <laughs> yeah, man. I think he was into it. I think so, too. Yeah. After, after that, like... He was posting some stuff on his Instagram about how he wanted nothing more than to just ring chords all day after singing with some barber shoppers at his show last night. So it's probably one of the higher honors of my barber shop career is like singing with the tenor of the four freshmen and <laughs> having him post on Instagram about it the next day. Yeah, man, that was a cool show. I really dug it. I liked the the intimacy of Cabaret. I agree. I, uh, I I don't know if you remember, but I brought one of my friends from work who um, I was working at a bar called Isabel at the time, and he is a bartender, fellow bartender and an actor as well. Like he's been on a couple episodes of like The Good Place and New Girl and, you know, some other stuff. But um, it was kind of interesting because he's he's a DJ as well. And like his kind of take on music was really fascinating. And he was like the, the things that he had to say about it were critiques that i didn't expect um he was like you know i really wanted them to be wearing matching suits and they weren't you know it felt like they should be leaning into this sort of like gimmickiness of you know it's the same group from however long ago and they should really be kind of doing up the outfits and everything and i thought that was really interesting what do you think uh djs what do they know (laughs) (laughs) No, I, I think he's probably right in some in some ways because 
he's in the audience and in many ways the audience has a wisdom that the performers sometimes don't possess but i think that that show was like a well-oiled machine and if they thought that the matching outfits thing would have taken them farther they probably would have worked that into the act yeah yeah totally it it, it did feel like a well-oiled machine for sure um like it, it felt like they had done that show many times before and it felt just like very easy and effortless for them up on stage uh but um, totally. it still felt new and exciting as an audience member for me at least that's the line is like the with any performance as we know it's like the line between the the fresh and exciting and the nothing can go wrong here these people are rehearsed <laughs> somewhere in the middle of those things is like the perfect place because especially with nightclub acts or cabaret or some or shall we say a legacy act like the four freshmen there's kind of like this okay what new thing is going to be how is this going to be fresh how is it even possible to be fresh that these this material is from like another era completely or many eras behind this current era but i thought that mm-hmm. show was i i just remember really liking the percussionist's involvement with the crowd because he he seemed like the like kind of like the band leader a little bit Mm -hmm. yeah definitely and um his name's bob bob something and uh he i think is like the most senior member of this iteration of the ensemble like he started in the group a long time ago i believe singing baritone and playing drums and now over time he's now singing bass in the group and is sort of the senior uh, member Bob senior member of the four freshmen shout out to him what a cool show that was that was a good time man thank you for I think you, I think that was your idea that you like came up with that you were like yeah we should go see this uh, four freshmen show because I remember I wanted to see something else that was like close to that on the calendar but we ended up going to do that and that was so awesome seeing seeing that music live is it's awesome because like when you hear a recording from another era and then you get a chance to see it live, there's like something, there's really some very magical, like, oh my God, I can't believe they managed to do that style in a, like now. Like there's kind of this, I can't believe they like did that. Kind of like when you see like a revival of like a, a, a great Broadway show. Yeah. I mean, also just for me, like as a, as a fairly young person um who hasn't seen a lot of like live music in my life i mean i i have but you know compared to somebody who's much older and wiser than i um to to be able to kind of like see a group doing the type of music that i never would have been able to hear in their prime um because we're talking you know 50s and 60s where the four freshmen like just started and uh, we're sort of at their peak fame level to then be able to like hear the records for the first time, you know, in, in my room with my headphones on and be totally blown away by it. And then to go and actually see it done live, you know, it, it, it's very like, it, it transports you back to a different time, back to a different era in a way that very few things can, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it can transport you back to another time in ways that I, I don't think, it, I think only, like really excellent film and really excellent music can do that. Yeah. It takes you to another place. Like it's, it's way beyond this is well rehearsed and how are they going to make it fresh? It's like, it takes you somewhere to another Mm -hmm. place that you visited with your headphones in your bedroom. (laughs) I have their, um, four freshmen and five trombones record that was gifted to me by a a barista actually or a a guy who started a coffee shop in san francisco Uh, that's one of their best albums i think it's great oh god it's good and there's like these cool there's solo sections where just each singer takes their solo and man that's a good record i haven't listened to that in a while yeah i'm gonna be listening to that later tonight for sure yeah dude yeah man put it on put the headphones on go to another place so talk to me about arranging because you are somebody that i first met through your arrangements and the first time we really hung out was at 
your house in North Hollywood. Uh, was it in North Hollywood that you were living? Yes, at the time. So we we hung out at your house and we were kicking it and listening to like your transcriptions of Eastern Airs tags. Was that like the first thing we did? Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, the Eastern Airs are great. I'm a big fan and I have done some transcriptions of some of their tags and some of their arrangements in general. I mean, Bob Baum is a huge inspiration for me as far as barbershop arrangements go. Cause I think, well, I guess a lot of people would consider the work that he did a bit outside of the realm of what we consider to be barbershop today. But for me, it's always fresh and always exciting and jazzy and interesting. And it subverts your expectations in the most tickling of ways. <laughs> Ooh, that's the good stuff. Yeah. How does he do that? How does he do that? Um, is that a rhetorical question? <laughs> oh, no, it's not actually. How should I try to answer that? Oh my god! I would gosh. like you to tell me. You turn on your arranger brain because we've been doing, mm -hmm. you know, nostalgic for a few minutes. But I would like to also interface your music brain and your arranger brain because I know that when you talk about your inspirations, you're being completely honest and. It, it may take a second. Like I know that from when I need to switch gears into, into accessing my arranger brain or my, my music brain, sometimes it's a little, a little while, but um, can you tell me how these Eastern air tags subvert your expectations? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, when we're talking about arranging specifically, I think there's the sort of, there's a sort of elephant in the room that we have to address and that's, you know, you can write the coolest chart, the coolest tag ever, and it will never take off unless the group performing it is really exceptional. Um, that's, and I, I, I believe that the Easterners were. Um, that said, I, to get sort of more nitty gritty into like what I think make the Easterners charts so fascinating is th there's a couple of things. I mean, first of all, they sort of have two leads in a way. Like that's kind of how I've always viewed that quartet is like having two like super high tenor voiced lead and tenor singers respectively. And either one of them could sing lead on any of their charts. Honestly, any, any four of those guys could sing the melody part and have it be just as compelling as the others. But the fact that, you know, they really have like a baritone, a low bass and two true tenors um and i think that allows them I, at least it allows the arranger to really have a lot of room and space to play you're not necessarily worrying about range in the same way um at least not for the lead part which is the best <laughs> honestly like trying to arrange within specific vocal range parameters for the lead singer is incredibly challenging but I guess to answer your question, I think what Bob Bone did really, really well with a lot of the Eastern Airs charts is he created these moments for super ringing barbershop chords to exist in really atypical con like contexts. Um, for example, in the um, Stars in the Sky tag from This Is All I Ask, um, there's it's stars in the sky make my dreams come true before the night has gone and let the music play as long as there's a song to sing um it's it's that first movement on the word sky stars in the sky uh, i that third chord there is like a dominant chord i believe it's i believe it's like a a, a just a nine chord but it's on the flat six, I think. I'm not looking at charts and I'm trying to remember over here since I've sung any tags, but um, it's out of the key and it's a dominant chord that's extended further than just, and it takes you completely by surprise. But it's also like here, it's a secondary dominant that takes you right into the next chord. And so it's this, it's this moment where it's like, 
you know, stars in the sky. And it, it, for me, it's sort of like this text painting thing where it's like stars in the sky and the sky, like just that movement there. That is the moment where you see a shooting star and your perspective on everything shifts. And so to then land on a chord that's outside of the key, but brings you back into the key with a fresh set of eyes and ears that I think is like the most brilliant writing. Cool answer, dude. Right on. Yeah. <laughs> that is a, that's a great way of putting that. And then I also thought while you were saying that, that writing for two tenors without range expectations is like a blessing. <laughs> yeah. It's a dream come true. <laughs> Yeah, a dream come true, you know, writing for quartets like Ringmasters or writing for quartets like, say, the Sun Tones or, mm -hmm. gosh, vocal spectrum. Quartets that really have, like, two just incredible tenor clef singers. <laughs> it is pretty swell, eh? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I, I think, you know, like even going a little bit earlier than, you know, some of the very obvious modern examples like Ringmasters, Vocal Spectrum, Lemon Squeezy, Newfangled, all these guys, um, you know, the quartet that sort of like is a little bit of a different, um, it's like a different category, but this is still kind of relevant is the Boston Common. Um, I think like one of the things for me that makes their sound so unique and so incredible is their tenor is mostly full voicing everything and his voice sounds like really classical and natural and like beautiful and they all kind of use a pretty thick vibrato with most of the stuff but they're just so locked in that you don't notice that the vibrato is happening chords are still ringing ringing it's 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 crazy and then there's like these moments where the tenor voice just shines out or he has some sort of counter melody or a tiddly or something. And it's just, it, 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 it's, it blows my mind every time I hear them. They have one of the most unique sounds for sure. Boston common, you know, mm -hmm. instantly you're listening to Boston common, like just like, bam, that, that their sound is so unique. Yeah. And nobody's, I mean, there's, there's that wait. Okay, so there's that Aliens parody where they're just singing to the track. But <laughs> it's so hard to, to try and sound like Boston Common. Yeah. You can try and you can make a silly Jeff Oxley or Tony DeRosa or Joe Connolly or there's all sorts of like, they're very iconic and you can, you can caricature them easily. Sure, yeah. But Boston Common, maybe not so much. Why is that? I mean, do you agree with that? I, I don't know. Um, yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, I think you can definitely like sort of caricature any individual singer from that group. But for a quartet to caricature or, or try to emulate that sound even, like whether it's like kind of, in, you know, poking fun of or like in the in the context of a comedy piece or just in earnest trying to sound like the Boston common, it, it's, it's almost impossible to do. And I think I, I can't say why that is. I think, you know, maybe somebody who has more experience in the singing category might be able to explain that a little bit more, but for me, it's just, it, it, it's crazy. Like they just, it's four singers that just have such open and spacious resonance that it just feels like they open their mouths and the needle hits the vinyl. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> it's so smooth. And it sounds so excellent every single time. It blows my mind. And, and maybe I'm saying this because I've only ever heard them on vinyl, you know? Because <laughs> just because of, like, the technology they had for recording audio back then. But, um, yeah, it's, that's, it, it's, it's a certain type of magic that they had that. I think all of us as barbershoppers at some point are, are sort of chasing after. <laughs> nice, dude. All right. Well, um, tell me a little bit more, you know, we had our conversation last time where we, I sort of like 
um, got a chance to pick your brain on some topics. And I also wanted to speak with you a little bit about um, barbershopifying pop music and like how that's successful. I mean, pop music as we experience it today and perhaps beyond parody. Sure. What do you make of that? That was something that we chatted about last time. So I, I thought a little bit more about that and I, I, I'm kind of torn, you know, just like we have been for, for forever. Like what is applicable? Like what can we borrow from, from modern pop music and what, how, how do we judge its successfulness? Yeah, it, it, it's interesting. You know, there's a very like, there's this is such a layered question, and I, I thank you for asking it, and I hope that you'll indulge me in try, my sort of Go for trying it. to diagnose this uh, complex question. But um, I so first the first thing I want to say is that you know so much of like what is very commercially successful in today's pop music is rhythm. You know, I think about, yeah, you know, like even like just having watched the Grammys not too long ago, the person that won pop album of the year um, was Dua Lipa for her album, Future Nostalgia. And have you listened to that album at all? I haven't. You should. It's excellent. <laughs> it's so fun. Um, that music is just like, it's incredible. Like I, I listened to it with my partner the other day and we just like couldn't help but like have a dance party in our living room listening to it. it's so joyful and like fun and the melodies are great the harmonies is great but I think like the thing about it that really really sticks out and makes it an album for me that is Grammy award-winning is how awesome and how like in the pocket the rhythm is like um she's got a song uh what's it called oh my god if you don't want to see me dancing with somebody um, it's called don't stop now and it's got this like ridiculous baseline you know and it, it just like it has these like sort of swelling synth sounds and then it just goes into this like like super pocket drum beat and the baseline is like and it's it just grooves so hard and it's so fun and so to, to before i like go on a whole tangent about the rest of that album which i could speak on at length but um because of like how great the rhythm is i think that's a really clear indicator of like where we're at in pop music now especially like with pop music being mostly electronic um it, it's very rhythmically oriented and that's something that is extremely difficult to execute in barbershop and in acapella music in general i think um the sort of contemporary acapella movement of uh, music kind of aims to emulate that with, you know, things like vocal percussion and like d a different style of arrangement. But when we're speaking of like barbershop, it's, it's really, really hard to do that. And I know you just arranged a chart with your quartet, the summer timers, whom I deeply love by the way. And I'm a big fan of your chart um, of uh, Christmas in LA by Wolfpack. And you did a really great job with that chart. And I, I can only imagine, you know, you kind of have this, you, you probably understand this more than anybody trying to arrange such a, such a rhythmic chart that it's, it's kind of hard to, to make it really work in barbershop and you have to have singers that can execute it well. Thanks. Yeah. You know, that chart was very interesting because the turnarounds or the <clears throat> harmonic uh, patterns in that song are almost like, uh, ostentatiously or sarcastically chosen. <laughs> in, <laughs> yeah, both like, tech is kind of that way. Yeah, and like especially in the context of holiday music, where like I don't know, just like like the last big hit we had was like Mariah Carey's breakout '90s jam. As far as I know, that's still like number one contemporary holiday tune. Yeah. And in the canon of Christmas music, you kind of have to give it up to Wolfpack for trying to go farther than Paul McCartney. <laughs> <It's> like <laughs> trying to be more egregious and a more obnoxiously earwormy. 
Yeah. And the turnarounds on that tune are very like, we're going to go 5-1, then we're going to go 2-5-1, and then we're going to pick like tritone, 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 tritone <laughs> in like the most <laughs> annoying way we could possibly do it. Hanging so we're presents more, yeah, exactly. under the tree. <laughs> so, so we can get like to another level of poking into your brain while you're trying to pick out lingerie at Abercrombie and Fitch or whatever at the mall. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think that brand is gone, but anyway, there's, <laughs> you know, like there's like this competition in the mall space in this new religion we have called mallism where you go worship the holiday season by buying stuff. And it's, it's like a, it's it's an amazing thing that that song for that for that reason and thank you also for the compliment, and I would also add that I think I'm really proud of my quartet for pulling that chart off somehow <laughs> because we had very little rehearsal on it and very little time to do that, and I'm really proud of those guys and I love them dearly and I really miss them and mm -hmm. I. Uh, I take a lot of inspiration from them and I had an opportunity to chat with them just as a quick aside about feeling inspired writing just for them. Yeah. There, there was a Eric Whitaker social media post where he talks about, if I remember this correctly, because this was a, a while ago that I, that I shared this with them and it's on the subject of writing specifically for an ensemble. He was mm -hmm. writing for his ensemble in London. I don't know what their name is, but he was sharing how, how much he loved writing exactly for those voices. And yeah. when I was writing the Wolfpack chart, even though it's pretty much a takedown of the pop tune, when I'm sitting at the piano and I'm putting down the notes, and I'm writing the baritone line, I'm thinking about Kadar. I'm thinking about the person who's going to sing these notes, which is so much more exciting than writing just a stock chart. Yeah. You know, like, totally. you're totally. like, you're kind of, the longer you do that, the more you're with those people in the room, even though they're not there. Mm. You're like, oh, this is going to happen because it's happened in the past. And I believe in this music and I can already see it happening, which gives so much momentum to the work. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. And, and just to kind of in, inject my own experience onto this uh, as well, you know, I, I've found that like over the many charts that I've done over the last couple of years, the ones that have been the most rewarding and the most memorable for me have been the ones that, you know, are sung by people that I know well and care about, whether that's, you know, my beloved C chordsman up in Seattle um, singing, you know, a, a fairly simple arrangement for their show that I put together or whether it's the newfangled four singing, you know, one of the songs that got put on their CD. Um, it, it's, it's those charts that e even if they're not necessarily my best work, those were the ones that actually for that reason, because, you know, when you're working, when you're sitting at that piano and you're writing for specific people, they're in the room with you. Yeah. And, I think you put it so eloquently. Oh, thanks, Nick. Yeah, you're 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 so you're so you're so you're so kind to um, return the the mirror of my emotional state here because it is so nice to write for specific people. It's just even if you're trying, even if like you're just trying to write a, like the simplest chart you can, or like the easiest to learn chart, or like you know, you're, you're, you have other motives <clears throat> towards getting the chart in good shape, but you still get to invite them into the room and you get to see mm -hmm. them sing it or, or maybe yeah. there's some other like magical neural process that's going on where you're like just grooving with them. Mm -hmm. And it's way different than like how you might describe coding a computer or something, or maybe, maybe not, I don't know, but like, it sounds kind of like, I don't know. There's two different ways to write for actors, right? So there's the, there's the method acting and then there's the David Mamet school of actors are just people that say what I wrote. 
And <laughs> like somewhere in between those places is like where the work actually happens. And like, I find my, I, I'm curious to know your experience as a writer, as an arranger, but like there's something kind of diabolical and like domineering about writing all the things that are going to happen, but you can't let that take you over, you know, like mm -hmm. that's not going to produce good work. Like in the same way as like, it's very difficult to t almost impossible or maybe fool's errand to tell people that they're wrong. Yeah, absolutely. I I've always thought of arranging more as, you know, more as a tour guide and less of a control freak. You know what I mean? Oh, that's a very nice way of saying it. Uh, tell me about your tour guide philosophy. <laughs> well, I mean, so for one, you're guiding the original music into this weird and, and um, specific style that we all partake in. But at the same time, you're also kind of at, in the way that you write what you're doing. You're also guiding the person who's eventually going to sight read your chart. And you don't want to be a control freak and put a million, you know, dynamic marks and accents and all this stuff, because then it's just like, all right, like it, it looks like I'm reading wingdings here, you know, like it's, it's hard enough to kind of execute just a, a well sight read melody. That's such a but, subtle joke. <laughs> <laughs> fucking wingdings. I know, right? <laughs> okay, go on, please. But you know what I mean, right? Like some, some, a lot of compo a lot of composers and a lot of arrangers will like really, really doctor up their their work with a, a ton of directions and like a ton of like asides and you know asterisks and and all this stuff of like interpretive notes and stuff, and that's but that's fine. I don't, I don't believe that you need to be that specific. Um, I believe in, in being specific when it's the most important. Um, and so I'll put like in, in my charts, I only ever write like a few crescendos and decrescendos or diminuendos um, and a few like dynamic markings. And that's really all I'll doctor it up because I want the person who's reading my chart to be able to focus on, you know, getting their line right. And then as the group comes together to work on this, they can take the interrupt how they want and how it makes the most sense for their voices physically um, with things like breathing and stuff, but also emotionally, you know, because the way that I experience a piece of music and the way that I, you know, experience singing a piece of music emotionally will be drastically different than the way you do, the way Tony DeRosa does or who, whoever, you know? And so my job as the arranger is just to take the chart, take the original source material, guide it into a format that makes sense for this ensemble, and then let it go. Hmm. Would you describe that as kind? Uh, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sometimes the original source material uh, lends for a really smooth and easy barbershopable tune. And sometimes uh, guiding the original source material into a barbershopable tune requires a lot of finagling and requires sometimes... Um, making it a little bit more physically demanding for the singers. And I try to avoid that at all costs because I want my singers to be successful in executing my chart, no matter who they are, no matter how experienced they are or how skilled they are. Um, I would call that very kind <laughs> and <laughs> <you>. smart arranging. <laughs> Less is more, yeah. right? right? I, I agree. And, and to kind of go back to the question that you were talking about, or that you asked me earlier about um, pop music in barbershop, um, I, I think this is one of the things that a lot of arrangers kind of really, really fail at, especially if they're arranging for top-notch groups, is they sort of like take the back seat and think, oh, it's like, I'm arranging for Newfangled. Like those guys can sing anything. And, you know, they'll put they'll put stuff that's just not proofread on the page and you know a lot of the times the guys can sing it but sometimes it's like all right this is really really hard 
and there are a few more like obvious choices for edits that would sound just as good, but be way easier to execute. And so rather than like the newfangled for nailing it 10 times out of 10, they're nailing it seven times out of 10 or whatever, you know, because nobody's perfect. And I'm not trying to trash talk those guys because those guys are awesome and I love them. Um, but it's just the fact of the matter, you know, like not everyone can sing everything perfectly all the time. And so it, you can't just go about something thinking, oh, this is a cool voicing of this chord and it's for an eighth note. And I want it to be this voicing rather than this other voicing that would make the voice leading for the individual singers better. Um, it, it's to me, these are obvious choices, you know, take the easier route on the sight read and have the cool voicings happen in moments that they really need to happen. I dig it, man. Do you see corollaries between arranging and composing a great cocktail? Oh, that's an interesting question that I did not see coming. <laughs> um, hmm, let me think about that for a sec as I sip my cider. I think that the things that make a great arrangement are, yeah, I, I do think that there are th things that make a good cocktail are things that make a good arrangement. And in a cocktail, like the thing that comes to mind is balance. You know, in a cocktail, you don't want to have something that has too much lemon juice in it because then it's going to be too sour. And you don't want to have something that has too much simple syrup in it. Otherwise it'll be too sweet. Um, and you don't want to have an old fashioned that has too much bitters in it because all you will taste is the bitters. Um, in the same way, you don't want to have an arrangement too predictable, and you don't want to have an arrangement that is, you know, too simple harmonically and too complex melodically. Like there's like a sort of balance between the two, um, and you don't want to have one that's too busy rhythmically and too and not. Um, lush enough harmonically it's 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 a matter of balance and the thing is you can have diversity in the same way that you can have cocktails that are more tart or have like more distinctive flavor notes you can have those more distinctive flavor notes in your arrangements provided the like the entire chart as a whole feels cohesive feels like it has a very um, concrete and foundational form to it you know Oh, right. Flavor notes. People often describe these as notes, right? <laughs> no pun intended, I promise you. But yeah, absolutely. Like like when you're tasting a fine wine, for example. But they don't mean you wrote the notes down I'm on the, like, is it, we've decided this is a 78 wine spectator and here's our notes. They actually mean the, the analog in music, right? Am I crazy? Uh, Am I just learning this now that that's not how it is? What do you mean by analog in music? I mean, well, when people, okay. So when my, <laughs> when I ask someone to describe a coffee right. or a, or a cocktail, they'll talk about the notes, right? They don't mean yeah, yeah. somebody wrote down some notes on this wine and they just, that those are the notes. They mean that literally there's a composition of harmonic structure analogous to music that when it hits your tongue or your palate or whatever, you're like experiencing like a, some kind of a structure, right? There's some balanced sort of deal. Yeah. Yeah. You know um, I think, I think wine or coffee work better in this analogy because when you're drinking wine, what you're drinking essentially is fermented grape juice, right? So really all you should be tasting is grapes, but there's obviously so much more nuance to that, to it than that. So you could have a wine that tastes like peach or tastes like, um, a sea breeze or, or sea salt or, or like something mineral or lilacs or, or lavender or all these, you know, different things just based on like where the grape grew up, where it was planted, what its in immediate environment was, what the weather was like, all of these things influence the way that wine will come out. And so the same kind of like the same sort of thing exists in arrangements, you know, like you could have like you know, a, a barbershop arranger who's arranging an Elton John song, but who's listening to a bunch of like Mel Torme at the time. And so you'll have these like, like 
you have like the grape which is the elton john song the winemaker which is the arranger and the environment surrounding the grapes which is like things like what the arranger is listening to um where the arranger is at in their own emotional life and their emo- own emotional well-being a- among many other factors right and so when like i could be arranging like the happiest song ever i could be arranging crocodile rock right but i could be in a really intense bout of depression in my life i could be going through something really really um terrible or, or traumatizing or um whatever and i could have moments in crocodile rock that are suddenly very sad come out you know um and those like very specific moments um those i think are like the sort of tasting notes of an arrangement in the way that you have like tasting notes for wine it does the arrangement doesn't sound like elton john the arrangement sounds joyful it sounds like a shooting star or it sounds like um a, a walk in on the beach at sunset do you know what i mean yes i do and i i can't help but try and dredge up some text i saw on instagram and it goes like this the soul is stained with the color of one's thoughts which I guess is somewhere connected between the division between uh, Protestantism and Catholicism. But really what you're saying is that an arranger has license to include their own emotional state in their work. Um, I'm not saying, I don't think that's what I'm saying. Um, uh, uh, I would agree with that statement and it's, I, I do believe that, but I think what I'm saying, you know, goes deeper than that. And I think what I'm trying to say here is that this type of thing operates on a subconscious level as an arranger. And sometimes I'm oh. making a sad arrangement of crocodile rock without realizing I am. So not really licensed, but more just like, there's no way to separate the arranger's work from their emotional state. Yeah, you're you're to go back to what I said earlier, you're a tour guide, you're not a composer. You're you're not a builder. You're you're not a constructionist, you know? You're a tour guide. You're taking something that exists already and channeling it through your own artistic voice. And in the same way that like a coffee filter will filter out like the more bitter taste and like the more earthy tastes and leave a, a bit of a more balanced and fruitful cup. Um Sometimes I blow your arrangement filter will. Sorry. Sometimes, sometimes I blow it with my coffee filtering. Like, I don't know if this is bad or not, but like, I'll like, I'll put the water in the Chemex and like, sometimes I won't watch it closely enough. I'm sorry to cut you off, (laughs) but I just like now have a a serious barista question here. Sometimes I won't like catch it early enough in its filtering and then i won't have enough coffee in the in the chemex like i'll have only poured like eight ounces of hot water through my Mm. filter but then all the grounds have like kind of solidified and then i just go ahead and like throw another like like disturb the grounds and i don't i feel like i'm doing it wrong am i doing it wrong um not necessarily so uh, uh to put on my barista cap for a second um because <laughs> i i did used to make money doing that um <laughs> you're an so, old guy you know about beverages <laughs> i've got you on the line here i can ask thank you yeah so what you want to do is first of all if you're not using a weight scale use a weight scale um and weigh out your coffee and i like to brew my coffee at a 1 to 17 ratio meaning i'll weigh out my coffee and it's a 23 gram dose and then I'll weigh out about 415 grams of water and that 415 grams of water goes through the coffee grounds. And the reason that it's that way is because scientifically that's the sweet spot, you know, one to 17, one to 18. Um, A lot of baristas would go a little bit stronger than that. But for me, I like a really fine ground coffee and at one to 17 or 18. So 
the reason that you do that is because as soon as hot water touches the coffee grounds, chemical reactions start happening. You know, the, the heat of the water will um, disperse the essential oils off of the grounds and any anything that is soluble on those coffee grounds will dissolve in the hot water and go through the filter but what is not soluble will be left behind um so you really want to make sure that the amount of like the the ratio to which you're brewing is controlled Mm, so i should get a, a scale you should get a scale yeah and also what you should do is you should just you should do what's called a bloom and that's if you're making a pour over at least what what that means is you basically just pour enough water over the grounds at first just to saturate them and then you wait until the one minute mark and then you pour the rest of the water oh i need and a what, clock too <laughs> it's yeah very, it's a big process i understand yeah uh, come over i'll teach you sometime yeah okay cool yeah, yeah. i should brush up my barista's knowledge because who doesn't love a perfectly brewed cup of coffee? I oh, mean, you just need it. I need it. I can't, like, I was having a conversation yesterday about planning a trip north. I'm, I'm going to go on a camping trip after I'm vaccinated. And I'm going to, my friend's going to pick me up in their RV on their way from Yosemite. And, like, I had a conversation with them about planning what was going to happen on the trip before I had a cup of coffee. And it was a wreck. I, do it. I was like so like just like like you know because like i love backcountry camping like i need to be out in nature like when i get when i go camping like i need to get away from any like like roads like fossil fuel burning rv situations and i was like mm-hmm. explaining this to my friend in not such a nice way because i hadn't had a cup of coffee yet as is my morning ritual and I was just so hard to work with and embarrassing. <laughs> so thankfully this person loves me and they gave me all the, you know, they gave me all the leeway and slack that I needed. But um, all that to say, even if I, <laughs> I should get, I should get a better, even more finely tuned ritual in the morning. And it might be even, even easier to work with because coffee is a magical thing. I love it. So we both love it. We, we love that stuff. Yeah. You get into agreed. becoming someone who balances beverages. I'm sorry. How did you get into, how did you become somebody who balances beverages? Because Nick, you're such a knowledgeable person about how coffee is brewed, how cocktails are made. How did you, how did you get into that? How did you know that that was like something that you were passionate about? Um, just to sort of, fundamental curiosity that's always always existed in me i think it's i think the thing that's like attracted me to this career path is is the same thing that got me into barbershop and got me into music in general it's just like a oh this thing is really special this thing makes me feel some type of way i need to understand this and i need to understand this right now um and i i think in the same way that i like dove into learning guitar at an early age and like dove into like singing barbershop. Um, I I really like got bit by the coffee bug at first. And then that later led me into wine and beer and whiskey and and spirits, which uh, ended up leading me into my current career path, which is uh, I'm working in a store and um, looking like working at a boutique liquor store, but under a guy named Dan, uh, Dan Scott, actually, he's a long-term Westminster guy. Right. Yeah, for our listeners, we should say that yeah, you work at a very nice liquor store. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And yeah, so Dan, a um, very uh, cool Westminster alumnus. Please go on. Yeah, absolutely. So he he sort of like mentored me in a big way. Like he's a big part of the reason that I like was able to get my first uh, job in a bar because you know I I had originally started. My, my first bar experiences were um, working for him a little bit under his uh, catering company, the Whaling Club. Um, and he, you know, I started out just like kind of busting dishes and stuff uh, and glassware and stocking up the bar and that sort of thing um, at events. 
but then over time, you know, he sort of mentored me, taught me how to bartend and is a big part of the reason that I like was able to get bartending job um, in my early twenties. And now, you know, during COVID, he was able to open up a liquor store and I've jumped on with him on that. And so um, that's kind of where I'm at now. And it's, it, you know, even at work every, every week, I'm like trying new and exciting different bottles of natural wine and craft beer, um, doing tastings with liquor reps and stuff. And it's, it's, for me, it, it's, there's a sort of endless thirst, um, not, not just for alcohol, but just for, for tasting and, and trying new things. And I think that sort of um, unquenchable curiosity has served me really well, um, not only in my life ventures, but also in my artistic ventures. Were your parents into like uh, this type of thing? Uh, my dad plays guitar um, and he, de- you know, he definitely is uh, my dad as an artist in a way. Um, but I think that he has kind of uh, always been sort of uh, very grounded by his practicality. You know, he was always like, you know, he would get excited about stuff and he would do artistic stuff and, and, and all of this, but he was always like kind of on a very steady career path. And he, he, got his degree in aviation and is a mechanical engineer with Boeing. Um, and so he's got like a very like stable work situation. Whereas like if I were to go into music or um, continue to bartend for the rest of my life, it's a, a lot less um, predictable. But um, my dad's an engineer too. And stable situations are what engineers are all about. And they can provide the foundation for their sons to be musicians. <laughs> that's all good man yeah absolutely but yeah and and i i mean obviously like my worldview is a lot different than my dad's but i don't have like i don't have anything in my heart but respect for my dad because he's a hard worker he's relentlessly passionate and curious and kind and you know to me is is, is also an example of like a great moral compass so i'm like really lucky to have parents like i do because they were role models you know they weren't control freaks they were tour guides oh bringing it all back i don't know how we can wrap <laughs> up this conversation any better than that nick thank you so much for coming on the podcast man this this is a wonderful conversation and i cherish it and it's been so nice to chat with you about this thanks derek you too man it's it's been very refreshing for me and uh i hope we can do this again sometime Oh, that sounds lovely. I would love to do that. And I also am very excited about singing tags in Pasadena at Midwinter Convention 2022. Oh my gosh. Pasadena. It's coming up, dude. A few it, it is. You know what? There's a lot of cool wine bars and cool places in Pasadena that we uh, can check out too. That's going to be like, it's going to be, it's going to be so incredible. It's going to be, oh, I'm just thinking about it right now. Like, Oh, dude, dude, we're... we should, you know what we should do? We should create like, like a Pasadena coffee, food and wine tour. Okay. As long as there's pianos involved. I'm there. Absolutely. <laughs> we'll figure it out. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get out of here, man. I love you. Thank you very much for coming on the show. I love you too, man. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's all love. I'd like to thank my guest, Nick Luna. And thank you for listening. I will see you on the next episode of the Harmony Ball podcast. Until then, I'm Derek Wayne saying, keep the dream alive.